Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, uh, What Goes Eep in the Peaks, A Natural History of Pikas, featuring Dr. Johanna Varner, whom I will introduce more fully in a moment with her pika toy. Uh, <laughs> so just a brief moment of introduction to myself and to the Natural History Institute. Um, my name is Jesse Rack. I'm the program director at the Natural History Institute, which is based in Prescott, Arizona. Um, and I first wanted to kind of introduce you to the Institute in case you're not familiar with our work. Uh, so we're a mission-based independent nonprofit organization based here in Prescott. Uh, and our mission is to provide leadership and resources for revitalized practice of natural history. So we're looking to integrate art, sciences, and the humanities in that goal. Um, and we believe that everyone can participate in the process of natural history, or excuse me, the practice of natural history. And that by so doing, they can learn to care for the world and in return reap the mental and physical health benefits of nature. Um, I wanna bring your attention to a couple of resources the Institute has to offer. One is our website, which just got pasted in the chat. Um, thanks, Jenny, which has all sorts of information on there, including upcoming programs. All of our in-person talks, uh, we live stream them as well. So even if you're not in the area, you can check them out. We record them and they live on our YouTube. Uh, so all of this whole webinar series and all of our talks will be there. Um, next up, we have a talk on February 2nd by the ASU history professor, Dr. Maurice Crandall. Um, and on Valentine's Day, so in case you're looking for something to do, we have another webinar. Um, so February 14th, the next installment of the Science and Communication webinar series, featuring a conversation with Nicole Friedenfeld, who is a scientist turned educator turned scientist slash educator, um, who is talking about the natural history of environmental education. So that one is a little different from these ones we've been doing in biology, but please share with your environmental ed friends. Um, I also wanted to say quickly that if you are so inclined as to consider supporting the work of the NHI, like all small nonprofits, this is a labor of love and your support is so important and necessary to our continued work. Um, if you're interested on the website, you can donate, but if not, that's okay too. You can still watch this for free. Um, is that a pika necklace? Joe? Yes, it is. <laughs> and pika earrings, Linda. And pika. <laughs> so um, a couple of things real quick about how we're going to work the logistics of the program tonight in terms of Zoom protocols. So a lot of people have been introducing themselves through the chat function and sharing where you're from, and that's awesome. Um, just to let you know, we'll be turning the chat off momentarily because we found it's a bit distracting if people are chatting back and forth during the program. Um, so that'll be off, but in its place, we will be using the Q&A function. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there on the right side there, there's a little icon with like cartoon speech bubbles. Um, and that will be on through the whole program. So if you have a question for Joe or about the Natural History Institute, uh, we will visit those later in the evening. We'll save the last 10 minutes or so to address your questions. Um, also, if you see that someone has asked a question or made a comment that was along the lines of what you were going to say, instead of asking the same thing, there's a little thumbs up icon. So you can give it a thumbs up and we'll see that a lot of people have the same question and then we can kind of address that. Um, finally, as I mentioned before, uh, this program will be recorded and available on the Natural History Institute's YouTube channel. Uh, you'll be emailed a link, I believe, tomorrow um, after you watch. So in case you want to share with your friends, share with your friends. Um, and now it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest here tonight, Dr. Johanna Varner. Um, so Joe is an ecologist and educator and science communicator um, based in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, although she has past lives as a molecular biologist, an engineer, and a blueberry farmer, um, she found her true calling studying potato-sized alpine mammals called pikas. You're going to hear all about them tonight and see pictures, too. Uh, these animals are not only important indicator species and mountain ecosystems, but they're also an ideal platform for public engagement in science. Um, by day, during the semester, she teaches a variety of biology courses at Colorado Mesa University, but during the summer, um, in her alternate life, <laughs> she, she spends as much time as possible observing the pikas at her study sites in Oregon, Utah, and Colorado. You may hear her refer to them as pika camp, um, so this is a real place, and, and this is where she does a lot of her work. Um, so thank you so much, Joe, for joining us. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Um, and so, great. And so we're going to turn off the chat now. Fantastic. And I think we'll just get started. So Joe, I have some questions for you and then we'll save time for 
uh, questions from the audience at the end. But I kind of want to start out with um, uh, your definition of natural history. So at the Natural History Institute, we have a very specific definition that we kind of defined. Um, and we like to think of natural history as a practice. So it's something you do, a practice of intentional focus, attentiveness, and receptivity to the more than human world guided by honesty and accuracy. Um, and it's a, it's a little bit to get your brain around, but that's kind of how we like to think about it. It's something you do. And I know this is different than the way scientists often think of it. So I kind of wanted to, to think about how do you define natural history and where do you see it in your work? Yeah, I think that's a great, a great question. And I just really, I really celebrate some elements of that definition, in particular, the definition of it as a practice and of, of intentionality and honesty. Um, I think that that I, you know, I have to say, I've never really sat down and written out a definition of natural history before, um, because ain't nobody got time for that. But I, um, I have definitely, you know, would think of it in the context of, of making observations about the natural world. Um, and I think that the, you know, the practice as something that you can do and something that you can also learn and something that you can get better at is, is a really important element of natural history. Um, in terms of sort of how it fits into my work, you know, I think that it's really foundational to, to everything that, that we do, especially as ecologists, that without those kinds of careful natural history observations, it would be impo impossible to sort of test these fancy hypotheses that we have about the world. Um, they're all sort of rooted deeply, I think, in natural history and observations and that practice. I like that. I like that you kind of started at a place of, of practice still when you defined it. You were like, it's observation. It's like experiencing the world. And then maybe you can ask questions about it. You can ask questions right. about it anyway, right? Yeah, so, yeah exactly. That's awesome. Thank you for, for attempting a definition on the spot. I appreciate You're welcome. that. <laughs> so um, I'd love to hear, we heard in your bio that you've lived many lives, molecular biologist to blueberry farmer. Um, and I kind of would love to hear your personal path way of how did you become an ecologist? What was this path? How, if I, if I may be so bold, what's the path of you kind of falling in love with the world? Yeah. Well, so I grew up in, in the mountains in Salt Lake City, Utah, and, you know, for a long time in my youth was sort of dragged unwillingly and then, and then later willingly on a lot of family vacations to the natural national parks in Utah and uh, to the mountains. My parents, you know, took us to, to go camping a lot. And so, um, I always really loved the mountains. I always felt that that was a that was a, a space that I felt really connected to sort of the world and to different organisms. But um, I have to admit that as a, you know as a kid and even through high school, I didn't actually really spend that much time. I would say practicing natural history or making observations about the world. Um, and I really liked science. I ended up going to college to study biomedical engineering, um, and I um, did a master's in biomedical engineering actually at MIT. And I, um, by the time I was sort of done with that, I, I was a little bit burned out. And so I was sort of taking this, this sort of step back from what I thought that I really wanted to do. I knew I really liked science. I really liked engineering. I really liked math, but I wasn't really very satisfied with the projects that I was doing, which involved spending a lot of time in a cold, dark room by myself, looking at stuff through a microscope. Um, and it was really important work, but like especially with the project that I was doing, there was a, you know, the, the, it was building a microfluidic device to study the single neurons in a three-dimensional culture and <laughs> um, said nobody else on this webinar series. <laughs> and so in the Q and A. No, yeah. <laughs> and I, um, you know, the, 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 ways that that research would make the world a better place were really important and could potentially have these big implications for helping people recover from these neurodegenerative diseases. But that like interfacing with the real world was like 10 years away from the work that I was doing now. And um, I think for that reason and the cold dark room by myself, I, I just felt like this was not really a satisfying um, field of science. And so I kind of took a step back. I moved back to my parents' house in Salt Lake City. I bought a ski pass. Um, I actually went to New Zealand and I traveled around and worked on organic farms um, where I learned I think as part of that experience, a lot more about sort of the way that we interface with nature and the kinds of effects that people have on natural spaces. Um, and in particular, you know, I spent a lot of time at this blueberry farm and I, I just feel like I really learned a lot um, from those guys about 
thinking about like species interactions and bringing native pollinators in to help, you know, grow plums <laughs> um, and all of these questions that I really had never considered as part of my biology training up until that point. And so when I came back to um, Salt Lake City, I got a job at a bakery. I was still, you know, sort of hanging out, taking some time off. And um, I had learned recently about pikas actually by watching Planet Earth by with David Attenborough, the, the original Planet Earth. Yeah. Um, it was the plateau pika was in that, but I was like, wait a minute, like, how could it be that I've grown up in these, in this habitat and never known about this animal? So I, I spent ask, a lot I'm of time. To, I'm sorry to interject, but you never no. saw a pika your whole childhood. Of being I'm sure that I saw them. I just didn't. <laughs> You just sit there. I just you had that. Just, yeah, I just like, didn't didn't pay attention to it. You know, I was not practicing natural history observations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's okay. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and so I um I sort of fell in love with pikas. I was going out hiking and trying to trying to watch them for fun. And then one day, the Salt Lake Tribune published a newspaper article, and they interviewed this woman who was a professor at University of Utah, and she had done her PhD studying pikas. And I was like, wait, 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 <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> people study these cute animals and they spend their time watching the cute animals in the mountains and it's yeah. science. I was like, that is the kind of science that I want to do. Oh, I love that. So yeah, so I sent her an email out of the blue. It was just like, hi, my name's Joe. I have a master's in biomedical engineering, and I think I want to be a pika biologist, and what should I do? <laughs> um, and she sort of, you know, gently suggested that I could take an ecology class as a start. Which I did. <laughs> <laughs> I <realized> it. It. <laughs> yeah. And I, I ended up actually um, applying for and being selected for a job to do um, as a technician in her lab, working with hantavirus in the West Desert in Utah okay. and doing some field work and, and working with animals outside and nature and found that that really suited me and that I had a really great relationship with um, my mentor, Denise. And um, ultimately she, she basically, when the funding for that project ran out, she said, if you still want to study pikas, like apply for a PhD and, and we'll, I'll support you. And so that's how that happened. <laughs> so I did my PhD from 2011 to 2015. And, um, I then got a job teaching here at CMU and am able to continue my work in the summer, as you mentioned, but do a lot of teaching in the academic year. I love that. What, yeah. what I love about that story is how kind of, I don't know, want to say convoluted, but, <laughs> but how convoluted, yeah. how, you know, non-linear, non-linear. Yes. I'm like, what's a, what's a more positive word? How non-linear yeah. your path is. And that's like something I see in myself as well. And that I yeah. like to talk to a lot of kind of aspiring young scientists about it's not, you know, you may think, you know, <laughs> what you're going to do, but so much is luck and, you know, just effort and just accident and just trying a thing and seeing if you like it and taking the parts you like and putting them to something else. So yeah, exactly. And that's exactly the advice that I always give people too, yeah. is first of all, it's okay to change career paths. Like even after you've invested a lot of time and money in one, like you will have gained transferable skills that can yeah. go to something else. And secondly, like, don't be afraid to contact people randomly from newspaper articles. Oh, for sure. Never be afraid <laughs> to ask people to talk about themselves and about yeah. their lives. They love it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you so much. And so now I, that's like a good transition too. So you followed this nonlinear path and you found pikas at the end of it. So let's get to the part that everyone wants to know about. So let's start real easy. What is a pika and why should I care about it? <laughs> yeah, well, I wanna show you guys a picture because I think that words just don't really do them justice. So let me pull up here is a picture of three oh my gosh. pikas. They are um, about the size and shape of a russet potato. So if you think about the like kind of potato that you'd find at the grocery store, you know, sort of fits right in the palm of your hand. Um, and they look, I think a little bit like sort of a potato when a guinea pig had a baby, but they're actually closely related to rabbits and hares. Um, so they've got, they've got these big round ears um, and really thick fur and they've got cute little furry feet. And um, they live in rock slides and boulder fields, typically in sort of higher mountain elevations. This species is the American pika, which is found in Western North America. Um, unfortunately, you don't have any in Arizona, but they are as far south as Southern Utah and New Mexico, Northern New Mexico, and into the Sierra Nevadas. And then um, go. this species goes up into um, Southern Canada and the Yukon. And then 
in Northern Canada and um, Alaska, there's a second species of pika called the collared pika, which is its close relative. And then there's a bunch of different species of pika that actually live in Asia as well. So there's, and in those species, some of them are rock dwelling like the American pika. Some of them are actually more ecologically similar to prairie dogs. So they build burrows and they live communally. Um, so, but these, these pikas that I study, the American pikas, again, about the size and shape of a potato. And interestingly, pikas are actually the only group of, in the sort of rabbit group, the lagomorphs, um, to call. So they make a vocalization. They sound a little bit like a dog squeak toy. I can make one a call for you. It sounds can like you? This. I find that it helps. It really <laughs> does sound like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they even have different dialects. So somebody in the chat on the at the beginning noted that in the Sierras where they're from, the pikas have a three-toned call. And in the LaSalle's in southern Utah, where I've been working a lot in the last few years, they have sort of a two-tone call. It sounds like. Oh, wait, can you do that again? I didn't hear you that time. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like a two-tone call, and and they sound different across their range. So um, they're very interesting. They're very cute. Um, in terms of why you should care, of course, there's good reasons and real real reasons. Um, the mm -hmm. good reasons are that they, you know, have really interesting roles in the ecology of mountains. I think that they are. Um, inspiring. They're really um, plucky. I like to say they are um, very. Um, industrious, they work very hard, and <laughs> um, and they defend their little territories um, with the you know cutest little chases and fights. But of course, um, you know, real reasons why why I really love pikas, of course, is also that they are just adorable, um, really charismatic, and they live in beautiful places that I like to spend my time. So oh. they're also a really great excuse for me to combine my professional and recreational interests. I love that. What's this guy in the top right doing? Carrying little grass in his mouth? What's what's he yeah. doing? Yeah. You know? So actually everybody, like your homework from tonight's webinar is to go Google pikas carrying flowers and you will find just a whole suite of really beautiful images of pikas running around with these big bouquets and, you know, maybe you could make them into Valentine's Day cards or something, whatever you like. Um, but they are, um, actually they, Unlike most alpine mammals, pikas actually can't hibernate. And so instead of spending the winter fattening up, or well, the, the fall and the summer fattening up and then basically going to sleep under the snow for the whole hard winter, um, pikas collect all of the food that they're going to eat all winter in the short summer when there's alpine meadow vegetation available. So this is a tremendous amount of work. Let me show you a picture of a hay pile. Please. Oh, and they're so, called hay piles. Oh. Yes. Um, and I challenge you to see if you can find the oh. pika in this picture. <laughs> it's oh not a super challenging one, but I have some that are more challenging. Um, in case you haven't found him yet, he's right here. So again, pika about the size and shape of a potato. Each pika can, needs to collect somewhere in some most habitats around like 65 pounds of food. <gasps> to survive the winter. And so they do that by making over 5,000 trips out to the meadow and back and carrying um, a large group of, of flowers, usually wildflowers and grasses in their mouths. So if you were to scale this to human terms, like that may not really look like that much food to you um, because it's just sort of this big mound of vegetation. But um, if you were to scale this to human terms, it would be like us making 5,000 trips to the grocery store, um, amassing something like 25,000 pounds of food for the, for the winter. And on every trip to the grocery store, you would have to run home with four heads of lettuce in your mouth. So the next time that you go to the grocery store, all of you—that's not what you do. I'm just kidding. yeah. <laughs> go check out the potatoes. Check out the heads of lettuce, and I think that it will give you kind of a good um, intuition for just how much work it is that pikas do in order to survive the winter. Oh my gosh! Wow! Oh my gosh! And you know, if you were to tell me just like, oh, they collect hay piles, like that story of them carrying flowers in their mouth it sounds like a made-up fact from like an animal like you see in a cartoon or something like it yeah. doesn't seem real um and I love that that's a real aspect of their natural history and yeah. a way to survive and is unbelievably cute it is 
It is. And so actually a lot of times, like when I am trying to find pikas in a rock slide, like depending on the place and the time of year, it's actually easier to see them when they're carrying a bouquet of flowers because they blend in really well with the rocks, but you'll see this bouquet of flowers going boop, 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 across the rock slide. And then you'll see it end at a pile. And then after it drops it off, it'll usually come up and like sit on the rock and sort of look around. <laughs> That's a really cute, oh my gosh. I love, I love that you can do the noise too. I'm, that, that was unexpected because I didn't even think to have like an audio file ready or anything. I know. I know. <laughs> also, real quick interjection. I see a couple of folks with your hands raised. If you have a question for Joe, you're welcome to enter it in the Q&A at the bottom right there. And then we'll get to him at the end. So don't look at that yet, Joe. We'll, we'll get to it, I promise. Um, so thank you. Uh, cool. Um, well, great. Okay. So you managed to do the impossible. You're living the dream. You went through this path and you found a way to get paid to do the thing you actually like to do. Congratulations, my friend. <laughs> can, can you tell us a little bit more about what your research is about? Yeah. So my PhD research was mostly looking at pikas living in this really unusual habitat. So I just told you that we typically find them in rock slides and boulder fields above about, um, you know, typically it's above about eight, 9,000 feet. So okay. like really high mountains at or, or near or above tree line. Um, but they live near sea level, actually, in the Columbia River Gorge, just outside oh. of Portland, um, yeah. in this really unusual kind of temperate rainforest habitat. And so at the time that I started my PhD work, um, basically, there had been um, two papers about this phenomenon. And basically, they both were like, there's pikas here. That's weird. <laughs> um, with a couple of, you know, nice natural history observations, but nobody really knew exactly what they were doing there. And so, um, so that was a big part of my work was trying to, to actually just make natural history observations. Like mm -hmm. how is it that pikas are living their lives in this really unusual habitat in this like dense forest with this thick moss cover over the blank, over the, over mm -hmm. the rocks. Um, in addition to that, um, I also was studying a population up on Mount Hood and um, that became kind of a, an adventure because that that sort of control population burned up in a massive wildfire oh, <laughs> after no. my first season. And so- Oh no, like uh, first of all, help, oh no for your field work, but also, oh, oh my gosh. It was, it was tragic. I sat down at, when I came back and I discovered that this had happened, I just like sat down and started crying. And I was like, this, this, this was Gimli's hay pile and we watched it and build it. And you know, my field assistants from last year had named all the pikas and, yeah. and you know, so Gimli, this is Gimli's hay pile. And, and Never you know, name your study pile. organisms friends. I know it's, it's Sorry. Really, yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> and it was a pile of crispy ashes. And my, my, I brought this big crew of undergrads and they were all like, no, I'm not sure what to do. Like, oh. like, like give her a hug or, <laughs> and I was like, my thesis just went up in flames. <laughs> oh, no. um, but with the help of some collaborators, some of whom I see are here um, in the attendee list. Thanks, Eric. Um, helped me re sort of re frame my thoughts about that study and um, think a little bit more about how this was really an opportunity to look at how pikas respond to wildfire. And so, mm. um, so we ended up sort of reframing that study, collecting uh, again, a lot of natural history observations about where there were pikas, what were they eating? Um, how were they sort of faring in this really burned and disturbed landscape? Yeah. And um, so that was actually the first time that um, anybody had ever studied pikas in wildfire. What? So um, did Gimli survive? Did, did I we never saw Gimli again. Okay. So I don't know. He may but have. Did some of them? Some of them made it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And actually, it was a really hopeful story in the end because mm -hmm. actually within two years of that fire, every single one of our study sites was occupied in at least one season of sampling. And so the pikas actually recolonized that habitat like oh. a lot quicker than I probably would have expected, given that it was like all burned, like totally, <laughs> yeah. totally, totally burned. And um, they, they also, we found um, some evidence that it seemed like the intermediate burn sites, mm -hmm. actually there was like kind of stimulated. So not a super, super severe fire, but kind of a low severity fire um, yeah. stimulated the growth of really like nutritious, dense oh. wildflowers and grasses. And those actually were the sites that had the highest abundance of pikas um, within about two years of the fire. So 
I'm not I saying I think oh, fire is good for pikas, <laughs> right. but it was at least not as bad as we thought. But it's survivable in some cases. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. How, I don't know, this is a dumb question, but it came to my mind. So I'm going to say it because there are no dumb questions. Um, how does recolonization work? Like, are they coming from another peak? Do they have to go down and then up or are they just on another place on that mountain? Yeah, no, it's actually a really good question. And so in I think the answer to that question is just it really depends on yeah. the kind of the that topography, right? So the the in this case, we were studying pikas on Mount Hood. And Mount Hood, mm -hmm. you know, in the Cascades is really different than the mountains we have in Colorado or Utah because it's like one mountain. Yeah. It's just one. <laughs> it's like the kind of mountain that kids draw. Yeah. Um and so in that case, you know, the, this fire actually wasn't that big in the grand okay. scheme of things. It burned most of the north face of Mount Hood. Um, but there were a lot of places that the pikas survived the fire in the, that they were there the following year. And then there were, you know, from, from those populations, you know, you can have individuals like especially babies um, after they're born, they basically live with mom for a couple of months. And then one day she kicks them out and it's really cute. She like chases them and like, throws them <laughs> off a rise. <laughs> it's like, get out of here. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's mean, but it's, but it's cute when they do it. <laughs> um, exactly. Your and, <laughs> yeah. And so, and then they have to go out and basically find their own territory and oh. start collecting food yeah. in order to survive the winter. And so um, a lot of times the, the dispersal that happens in this like recolonization dynamics, you know, sometimes it's juveniles and sometimes oh. it's adults. Okay. Moving oh, that's cool. Well, thank you for letting me derail you for a moment. So yeah, cool forest fire stuff, mm. populations recolonizing, rebounding after a fire. Um, yeah. What are you working on now kind of in your Utah stuff? I think it's yeah. Utah now in Colorado. Yeah. So when I moved to Colorado, um, I, you know, still go out to the Columbia Gorge, you know, once a year or every other year or so to check on a couple of things. And I have some temperature sensors out there, but it's pretty far away. And um, research money is a little bit limited um, because I'm at a really teaching heavy institution. And so um, I kind of switched instead to working at um, this really interesting site in the LaSalle Mountains. And the LaSalles are this really cool mountain range right outside of Moab, Utah. So if you think of like classic Utah, Red Rock, Desert, Delicate Arch, um, landscape, the LaSalle's are actually the mountains that are in the background of that particular yeah. viewpoint. Um, and so this is a really cool mountain range because it's really far south in the Pika's distribution. So it's kind of right on a range edge where we would kind of expect the like abiotic conditions and the natural history of the animal to be really important in terms of yeah. how they're doing. And then in addition to that, they are really, really isolated. So like when we think about these recolonization dynamics that we saw from pikas moving around from Mount Hood in the LaSalle's, pikas are kind of limited to um, these alpine habitats in a lot of cases because they are sensitive to higher temperatures. And so a pika can't cross the, the desert to get yeah. from from western from the mountains and rocky mountains in colorado across the the great desert to get to the la so yeah. they're kind of stuck up there um let me show you guys a picture of what my study site looks like here um so this oh, is yeah. a picture of <sighs> where we're working. These are two of our, our tagged wow. animals. And you can see that actually from this viewpoint, this is actually a picture I took in the morning, watching pikas, drinking coffee in a puffy coat and looking out here. And this is actually Moab, Red Rock Desert. You can see it a little bit better in this picture. Um, and I'm looking at down here, all of these like tourists just getting totally sunbaked. <laughs> um, <laughs> obviously can't see them from there, but I know that's what's happening because it's like 100, 110 degrees down here. And it's like a, maybe a high of, of 70 or, or 75 um, at, the, at the warmest up here in the field site. And you can see there's still patches of snow left from the winter um, in August. This is at about 11,000 feet. And so um, the LaSalle's are just a really interesting uh, mountain range because they're so isolated there um, and nobody had ever really done a lot of study there but there we had some reason to believe that some of these kind of population dynamics might be a little bit different in these really isolated mountain ranges um, compared to the more like big out mountain ranges so you could think of it kind of like being like islands in the sky where the rocky mountains these big well-connected mountain ranges where you've got a lot of connectivity at high elevations those would be kind of like being at the mainland and the lasalles are basically like 
Fiji, right? They're like mm. a tiny island in the middle of ocean that is uncrossable by pikas. And mm. so that's what we're really trying to do. We're actually doing a mark recite um, study where we actually try to catch the pikas. Um, we anesthetize them so that they don't get too stressed out. And then we um, put in these little colored ear tags so that we can identify them through binoculars. Um, they're super cute. And um, then we release them and we collect a lot of natural history observations about what it is that they're doing, um, what they're eating, um, mm -hmm. what the temperatures are in their, their territory. And then we come back every year and see if they are still there. Um, so this has been really fun. Um, it's been really interesting. It'll take a little while before we can really say what exactly is going on. Um, but it's, it's really beautiful place to spend some time during the summer. Again, like getting paid to drink your coffee, looking at this, that's cuckoo. Like, exactly. okay. I love that. Um, yeah. And I think our folks that are here watching from Arizona can probably identify with the island in the sky concept because we, especially around Southern Arizona, we know about the sky islands, which are, you know, the same idea of just things that live in the top habitats have a really difficult time of going down and up. And in many cases, unless they're birds or maybe right. something really mobile, like a mountain lion probably isn't doing it. Um, so, and I can imagine how hard it would be for a tiny little mammal to get yeah. across. Right. Oh. Or a little potato to run from. Yeah. I want to ask, <laughs> <Not you, me. laughs> ask you to, to clarify something that you mentioned a minute ago. Um, you said you were thinking population dynamics might be different down there. What do you mean by population? Like what, what part of it? What's, what do you expect to be different? I think. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Well, there's some evidence that in some parts of their range that there's, some some populations of pikas that are declining as a, res as a result mm -hmm. of climate change. And it okay. seems like those declines are strongest and most closely linked to climate in more isolated mountain ranges that oh. are have a smaller amount of habitat. But, you know, you might see this decline, you know, out there in the world, but in order to really understand exactly what's going on, you kind of have to understand like, why is it that individual animals is, aren't surviving? And right. so, um, I don't know, you know, to be as a disclaimer, I don't actually know that that's what's going on in the cells. We don't actually have any evidence of a climate mediated decline mm -hmm. there yet. Um, but that's one of the things that we're looking out for is sort of how is this population doing? What are the predictors of individual survival? Like, is it, do you survive better if you have a cooler temperatures in your rock slide, or if you have more flowers in your, in your territory, or if you have, you know, all of these different, you know, possible okay. predictors, fewer to parasites, or maybe it's, you know, cause maybe it's disease that's going on. Um, and then I have collaborators who are working in more mainland habitat in Colorado and Montana. And by collecting the same kinds of data in the La Salle's, we can compare them to these other populations where we have a long history of this kind of data and be able to say, okay, like, you know, the same things are, are driving survival here as what's driving survival there. Um, or maybe it's not. Okay. Thank you. So population dynamics in terms of like who's surviving and or not and why right. in each population. Okay, cool. Thank you. That helps a lot. Um, yeah. And actually I had a follow-up question about, I'm just coming up with questions. Um, there's so much I want to know about pikas now. First of all, how do I get your job? And no. Um, <laughs> um, so, and maybe this is, I'm trying to think of how to frame it. Um, so you talked about how hard it is for them to kind of colonize places that are far away if they have to cross the desert but they have a very wide distribution around the world. Like you mentioned Alaska and Asia, did you say Asia? Mm -hmm. um, how did, like, did there start out being pikas in lots of places and then like things split apart and they ended up on the tops of mountains? How did they get there? Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, I think that's a great question. So um, a lot of times in this kind of um, work, when you like identifying where a like lineage of, of organisms started is usually the place where it has the highest diversity, right? So we have two pika species in North America, in Western North America, but there are like, you know, 30 pika species or something in Asia. And so it's actually thought that they are a species that originated in that part of the world or what is now that part of the world, and that they actually came across the Bering Strait um, into North America um, and basically got as far south as our Western US mountain ranges. Um, and during the last ice age, probably they were kind of commingling in the valleys, right? And then as the glaciers retreated, tracking their sort of preferred um, niche, they, they moved upslope and became more isolated on these mountaintops. 
That's so cool. I didn't know that. I mean, and yeah. while you were speaking, I was imagining, you know, the like artwork you see in the history book of the, the people walking across the Bering Street. But right. then I was picturing like pikas like, like running among their feet. Behind them. Like, <laughs> yeah. I like to imagine that too. It's probably not really how it happened, but <laughs> well, what if it was. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Thank you for that. Was a question that just kind of came to my mind as mm -hmm. you were discussing how hard it is for them to move around. Yeah. Um, so something else that came to my mind, you were talking about just observing their natural history and watching them collect hay and doing other stuff. Who else is living up there that high on the mountains? Like, are there interactions with other species? Does something eat pikas? Like what's going on yeah. in the ecology? Yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of species that eat pikas, but probably the most um, sort of successful predator of pikas is the weasel. So weasels, um, long-tailed weasels and short-tailed weasels, they're they're about this big. They're not actually that much more massive than a pika, but they're longer and skinnier mm -hmm. and they're fast and really yeah. like dirty. <laughs> and so they actually can like follow the pikas down in the rock slides in a way that a lot of other predators like birds of prey or coyotes, um, you know, or bobcats or something really can't um, oh. like get down into the rocks. And so usually um, when the pikas like run away from a predator down in the rocks, they can get away from most predators that way. It's quite effective. Um, but weasels sometimes can kind of follow them through. So that's definitely their primary predator. And then there's a lot of other animals that sort of share habitat with pikas. Um, one thing that we're interested in right now is whether they might potentially be interacting with marmots, which are these big, they're basically giant ground squirrels. Um, you know, they're, they're related to groundhogs, right? So if you've ever seen a groundhog on Groundhog Day, it's, it's a member of the same genus. Um, and they, you know, they're much, much bigger than pikas, but they, um, instead of making a hay pile, they fatten up and then, hibernate to survive the winter. Mm -hmm. And so um, there, we think that there may be some kind of interesting interactions going on there. Um, and the other thing, the other work that I'm sort of tangentially involved in is that I'm helping to advise a really wonderful graduate student named Mallory Lambert, who is actually looking at whether pikas might interact with the introduced herd of mountain goats in the LaSalle's. Oh. So the LaSalle's are also unique because the there are is a, a herd of mountain goats there. It's um, several hundred animals that were introduced by state management agencies um, there about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody's ever actually looked at whether or not they might be interacting with the pikas, um, either in their native range or in their introduced range. And so that's wow. really one of the things that Mallory is looking at. She's setting up these grazing exposures to look at sort of what is the effect of each species on the above ground biomass, but also on the nutrients of the soil and, um, you know, they're sort of how they behave when they're by themselves versus together. Um, yeah. And it's really an interesting question that again involves a lot of really um careful natural history observations mm -hmm. um because uh in general usually a larger herbivore can can actually facilitate a smaller herbivore meaning mm -hmm. that they may actually modify the habitat in a way that makes it better for pikas by allowing for more high quality vegetation in the grazing oh. line um, but it may also be that they could be competing because these alpine ecosystems are really, really nutrient limited. Um, and right. limited. there's just not like a lot of lush green plants right. up there. Which um, same deal with the marmots, right? They're all kind of trying to eat the same stuff. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's another thing that she's trying to do is kind of parse out like exactly what are each of you guys eating? Like, <laughs> and cool. how much? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, Mallory, when you finish your PhD, give me a call. We'll get you down here to the Natural History Institute. We'd love to hear the end of this story. So yep. um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing so much about the natural history. You know a lot. This seems like I love that it's so your research itself is so deeply rooted in natural history and is a practice that kind of anybody can do. Anybody can go out and be like, wow, look at that mountain goat. What's it doing? Is it yeah. doing something with that pika? Is there something going on? Yeah. Um, Exactly. And actually, I, Go ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say that's actually like an exercise that I often have my students oh. do in some of my lab classes it yeah. is, you know, they, they have to find an organism and then sit there and ask, you know, 20 questions. And they're like, oh my God, 20 questions. Like, and so they're like, why is the plant green? What is this beetle? What is the beetle doing? And then they're like, wait, what is the beetle doing? And then they're like, <laughs> you know, and I think that it's actually really cool that like anybody can make these kinds of observations and these observations really um, underlie a lot of interesting scientific questions that you might not notice or even think to ask without that kind of observation. 
Yeah, related. I have like a, a lesson I teach about nature journaling where it can be something outside or an animal or it can be like just something you bring into a classroom where yeah. first you have to write down 10 things you notice. So observations yeah. and then you have to ask as many questions as you can about it, like 10 questions. And then yeah. you have to try to make connections and be like, what does this remind me of? Mm -hmm. like, what are the things? And so it's just like a nice pathway into the practice of natural yeah. history. So cool. Yeah. Well, for all the people in the chat that were in the chat at the beginning saying that they'd seen pikas in the wild. Is there an app for that, Joe? <laughs> there is an app for that. <laughs> I'm so glad that you, you asked. Like that? <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me uh, I'm gonna share my screen uh, again here and, and yeah. show it to you guys. So there's a new app, it's called Pika Patrol. Um, oh. Everybody, you should go, this is your second piece of homework is to go download Pika Patrol. Um, it's an app that I've been helping to develop for the last, um, I don't actually even want to tell you how long it's taken. It's been, <laughs> a, um, <laughs> it's been a long time in the making, um, but it is, I can guarantee one of the cutest apps in the app store. Um, and it's an opportunity for anybody to contribute pika observations wherever you live. Um, well, if you live where pikas are, or if you travel to where pikas are, um, you can submit an observation and let us know where you see pikas, um, what they sound like. So you can actually take a photograph of the habitat or the animal if you're able to get close enough. Um, and you can record sound. So you, you can help us to understand some of that regional variation in the dialects and their calls. Um, and it basically the app will pull your <laughs> GPS coordinates from your phone, as well as the date and the time. And then you can fill out this relatively simple form to tell us um, how you saw pikas, um, if you heard them, et cetera, like how many you were able to detect, um, and a little bit of information about your survey. So the app also has um, embedded training materials. So if you're new to pikas or you, you do, it's been a little while and you don't really remember what they look like or what they sound like, um, there are pictures and sound calls of um, pikas. There's pictures of their poop. Um, and so that you can identify them that way. There's pictures of hay piles. And this was something that was um, brought to fruition by hundreds of hours of investment, um, both from our app developer, uh, Chris Sprague, who works for T-Cube Studios, and then also this great group of folks, the Colorado Pika Project, um, which is a partnership between Rocky Mountain Wild and the Denver Zoo, and with some funding from If Then. Nice. And this is a free app? It's free. It's available in the app store right awesome. now. You can get in. <laughs> Thank you so much. That sounds great. I'm sure there'll be some questions about that. Um, yeah. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so this is a great like community science initiative and a great way to get folks, no matter what your background is, involved in just like natural history and science in both of them. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so I have two more quick questions. There are a uh, buku number of questions in the Q&A. So we'll get to those in just a moment if you can all sit tight. Um, so a couple of final ones. I know you do a lot of other outreach besides just PICAs. Would you like to have a moment to kind of speak to the work you're doing to be a role model for middle school girls in science? Sure. Yeah. Right. So the, the <laughs> initiative, if then, that I mentioned that helped to fund the development of the PICA app is a really cool program. It's um, basically they selected 125 um, women in science. And just for all of you who are attending this, if you didn't know, Dr. Jessie Rack, our host, is also an if then ambassador. So she gets to share a little bit of the limelight here. Um, we but, knew each other ahead of time before this interview. <laughs> Well, we actually knew each other before, even before that, before even if then, but anyway, <laughs> um, and we do actually talk like this, just so that you guys know, like, it's, this is not made sorry. up, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, Anyway, If Then is this um, really cool project that came out of Lyda Hill Philanthropies. And she, Lyda Hill is a, is a woman, a very wealthy woman from Texas who um, has decided to make it sort of a big part of her mission of her philanthropy um, to change the way that scientists are portrayed in the media in particular um, to sort of increase the visibility of really um, real women in STEM. And so as part of this program, both of us have had an opportunity to, um, to participate in a lot of different kinds of outreach. Um, I got to go to um, Comic-Con this summer and dress Tell up us. as Pikachu, who by the way is um, thought to be modeled after Pika. And Pikachu's a Pika? <laughs> yeah, and a lightning bolt. It's like a cross between <laughs> a Pika and a lightning bolt. Of course, bolt. well, obviously that one is yeah. clear. <laughs> and 
and also to talk about pikas to kids and, and, you know, to share sort of our, you know, my story, um, probably the most crazy and exciting part of this initiative has been, um, that they did a 3d scan of all 125 of us and actually made us into 3d printed. <laughs> so here's me. I also have a pika dress. Um, so it's gonna be that. there's going to be some questions about all of your pika. Yes. <laughs> Um, with my life-size statue, here I am with my family, um, my partner, and uh, here, this, this is when they were in Dallas, they sent this to Jesse. That's this a text she sent me, yeah, the two of us looking at each other. <laughs> yep, and here we are visiting each other, um, we weren't in Dallas at the same time, but thankfully we were able to find each other. Here she is in the background of my, of my picture as well, oh. so you're in as many or more pictures. <laughs> Um, but this one over here actually was um, when these statues were on display at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And that was really, really cool. Um, I have to say when these first came out, I was not like super thrilled with the orange color. I thought it maybe looked a little bit like Happy Meal toys from the 80s. <laughs> but um, but I actually what I came to really celebrate about the orange is that like when people walk by an exhibit like this and they see all of these orange statues, they're like, that is a thing. I have got to go check out that thing. <laughs> um, that is a really I never thought about that. I was yeah. And that was really clear to me when we were in DC at this exhibit that there were so many people that walked by and then they were like, wait a minute, what mm -hmm. was that? And then they like would backtrack, like, you know, literally take steps backwards and come in the gate and be like, what is going on here? Um, and I think that you know, it was really cool to be among those statues, but the thing to me that was the most powerful about this was just like this, this essentially is like a catalog of careers that exist in science. Like, mm -hmm. I think that what's so powerful about these statues is seeing them all together and like watching kids like wander through them and look at them and be like, wow, I never even thought about being a scientist in the sports industry, or I never thought about being a scientist in the fashion industry, um, or about the, you know, mathematics of rocket science or about the, you know, all of these different fields that uh, are represented by these women who are all kind of trailblazers and leaders in those fields. So it was really cool. It was really inspiring. Um, and I hope to be involved in more cool things through them in the future. Love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking about that. Um, yeah. Okay, last question before we go to the Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to kind of circle back to where we started at the beginning with mm -hmm. defining natural history. And I mean, it's been clear your whole conversation we've had, natural history is in everything you do. Um, yeah. And yet, I, especially as I've stepped away from academia a little, I know that natural history is really often looked down on by science and it's thought almost like too simplistic, not really relevant. Can you speak to this? Can you give us a vote for natural history and it's important? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's pretty clear from what I've talked about is that, you know, most of my research is really like deeply rooted in sitting and watching organisms and taking careful observations um, and practicing that sort of honestly and um, attentively um, and intentionally um, to sort of speak back to your definition. And I think that, I just think that sometimes that, especially as some of the like um, analytical tools that we develop, like get really, really far advanced and we're able to do some really, really interesting like really big data analyses, especially in ecology where like data are messy, patterns are messy, nature is messy, um, and you need a lot of data to be able to understand what's going on. Um, I think that it's easy for people to like get really caught up in like the coolness of all of those tools and to kind of forget how all of the data that they're dealing with had to come fundamentally from natural natural history observations. And this is basically how the discipline of science started. You know, people who like the first scientists were not like, I'm gonna just be a scientist, right? They were like people who had other jobs and were making observations about the natural world. Um, and so I think that it's just important to sort of um, sometimes sort of reground ourselves on earth like, and all of the organisms yeah. and to remember that all of the organisms that we study have these interesting natural histories and these interesting, you know, lives that they live out there, um, you know, and that those kinds of observations are really foundational and support all of the rest of the science that we do. Thank you. That was great. I love that. Thank you for saying that. And it's so, so nice to hear because often I think it's easy to get separated from 
how everything in nature is rooted in nature, you know, if you're in a lab too much. So it's nice yeah. to hear a book for natural history. So thanks so much. Yeah. Um, it is time, everyone, for us to turn to the Q&A. Joe, if you want, I can just read them to you and you don't have to look sure. at them or it's up yeah. to you. But yeah, okay, <laughs> question number one, I'll try and get through them all. Um, yeah, we'll do our best. Here we go. Okay, where did you get your pike and necklace and earrings? Laura in Edmonds, Washington wants to know. Yes, um, the the earrings, so I'll get a little bit closer so that you can see these. These actually came from the gift store at Great Sand Dunes National Park in Colorado where there are pikas. And the necklace came from a student, um, a former research student of mine who gave it to me. So I don't have any idea where she got it from. But I will say that my best pro tip for acquiring cool pika swag is gift stores at um, either small nonprofits or at uh, natural national parks or state parks or wildlife oh. areas. They have the coolest swag. Um, so Etsy might be a good resource too. Like yes. if anywhere oh, was, small yes. makers. Yeah. Yes. And um, Redbubble, the, mm -hmm. my pika dress from the statue pictures, that came from Redbubble. And that's actually a store that supports the Colorado Pika Project. So if you look up the Colorado Pika Project, they've got some really cool art that you can buy on t-shirts or coffee mugs or dresses or whatever. Um, Love yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. A couple of kind of follow-up questions of location. So where are pika locations in other states, specifically Oregon? And are there studies being done on pikas in either California or Washington state? Yeah, so, um, you know, pikas are found in Oregon and Washington state in the Cascade Range, basically kind of along the Cascade Crest and, and kind of on either side. Um, but in Oregon and Washington state, as I mentioned before, they're super interesting because they are found at really low elevations. And so um, so that's actually the Columbia River Gorge is literally like the, the lowest elevation that we find pikas in anywhere, this species anywhere in its range. Um, so if you ever have a chance to go check out the pikas in the Columbia River Gorge, if you're in Portland, you should definitely go check it out. Um, in California, you can find pikas in the Sierra Nevadas, um, and there are definitely are a lot of other people who are studying them in those areas. That's great. Thanks. Um, so here's a really good one that I'm curious about, too. Do pikas opportunistically feed in cash lichen? Do they um, eat ever? <clears throat> Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, I have seen pikas eating lichen. Um, I have oh. found it in their food caches occasionally, especially in the Columbia River Gorge where you get these big like folios lichens. So like typically the the lichen that that like the lichen that I showed on the picture of the pika here. I'll just show it again rather than I'll do it again. <laughs> let's just pull up the pikas again. <laughs> well, so this kind of lichen um, is kind of a lot more common in these more alpine habitats and we call it crustos lichen because it's more kind of crusty. And I've never seen them like gnawing on that um, before, but the the kinds of lichens that you find in some of those temperate rainforest habitats are more like mosses kind of mm. in terms of their consistency and their size. And so I've seen pikas eating those. I've seen them caching those before. Um, and then actually one of the big things that we found in the Columbia River Gorge at least was that pikas were also eating a lot of moss, um, which was really interesting because basically nothing eats moss because it's basically like eating a cereal box. Like it's <laughs> Like nutritionally, like, like not packing peanuts. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I think it's fascinating. Packing peanuts. <laughs> well, related on the food question, have you compared to what they're gathering to what's available? Like, are they selective feeders, or do they not have the opportunity to be? Yeah, no, that's also a really great question. And that's one of the things that we're actually looking at in the LaSalle's is trying to understand sort of what are they eating versus what's available and, and how selective are they being in that. Um, they definitely are selective um, in other habitats where people have looked at that. Um, I don't really have an answer for that question from my study quite yet, but I hope to sometimes. Stay soon. tuned. <laughs> um, stay tuned. But one of the really cool things that they do is that they selectively during the summer, they eat plants that are non-toxic that are like easy to eat a lot of um, and easy to digest. But the plants that they cache in their hay piles are actually super, super toxic. So they have really high levels of this class of toxins um, that are called phenolics. It, phenolics are the same class of toxins that um, include tannins. So like when you get that sort of astringent mouthfeel in your red wine or in your yeah. coffee, um, those are, are the same kinds of toxins that are in a lot of these plants and they bind to proteins to disrupt the guts of herbivores. But um, the when pikas like actually go for these toxic plants, um, the toxins over time kind of act like a natural preservative. So they actually help mm. to enhance oh. the preservation of the plant over the winter um, in the food cache of the pica. 
Yeah. That's fascinating. Oh, no, that's and they, fascinating. they collect a variety of plants. Some with just a little bit of toxin will be ready to eat right yeah. away. And then the ones with a lot of toxin will be remain fresh until um, closer yeah. to the spring. Yeah. Oh, that's a great, oh, that's so cool. I can't wait to hear the end of all these stories. Um, this next one's from Fred Leonard. And so he kind of wants to know, you touched on this a little bit, but if you could just give us kind of a, uh, an overview of like given climate change slash global warming, how threatened are pike is due to loss of habitat? Yeah. So I would say that, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of people who are concerned about that and it just seems like it's really variable. So in some parts of the range, we're seeing these declines and in other parts of the range, the population seem to be relatively resilient. Mm -hmm. um, in either case, I think it's not really likely to be due to loss of habitat. Mm -hmm. So um, their rock slides and boulder fields, the talus that they usually live in, actually among habitat types is one that doesn't change very much. You know, it's not like you can go cut it down. <laughs> Sometimes they, they, you know, they can be bulldozed and harvested or, you know, for rocks or, or developed or whatever. Um, but those are relatively rare. I think that, you know, a bigger issue is associated with, you know, the potential for the changes in the temperature and precipitation regimes to affect the way that the pikas behave and how mm -hmm. active they can be during the summer. And so that's definitely an area of active research. And, you know, from my perspective, it seems like it's, there's just a lot of variability, which I actually think makes the species more interesting rather than less mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. So kind of like indirect effects of stuff's changing stuff, and then you don't know what's going to happen and each population yeah. can be different. Yeah. Sounds messy. It sounds like nature. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you for looking into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Okay, I'm going to read this paragraph from my friend Russ, who's great. Uh, Russ is born and raised in Salt Lake City, so he has that in common with you. Awesome. In 1968, he was on a fire lookout miner's peak in central Idaho, 7,800 foot elevation. His only companionship was the pikas who lived in the rocks surrounding his lookout. He loves your bark. Um, and he has a question. He wants to know if they're monogamous. And semi-related, uh, Jeanette wants to know, are the pikas in your study genetically different from other populations? That's not that related, but semi is. Yeah. Kind of. And yeah. Um, let's let's yeah, come back so, to that one. Let's do monogamous and then monogamous. like reproduction family structure. How about yeah. that? So pikas are, um, I think a lot of times people would refer to them as, as facultatively monogamous, which just means they're oftentimes only have one mate because it's handy. <laughs> um, and so what from the literature that from people who have looked at this, it seems like they basically mate with whoever's next door. Um, so they're, right. <laughs> they don't seem non discerning, to be discerning, <laughs> um, pretty much go for convenience. Um, and if that same partner is convenient from year to year, then off you go. Um, yeah. But uh, and then in terms of the genetic difference or genetic differentiation, um, the pikas at my study site in the LaSalle's actually cluster with the Southern Rocky Mountains. And so mm -hmm. they um, are more closely related to the pikas in the Rocky Mountains south of the Colorado River than they are to any other group of pikas, which is interesting because like geographically, they're not actually really closer to that than they are to some of the the genetic lineages from like the Great Basin Range or the sort of central Utah plateaus. Um, but uh, that's where they cluster. As far as more in-depth kind of population genetic stuff, um, nobody's really done that, but we're hoping to with some of the, the samples that we're collecting from my study. Um, cool. So stay tuned. Oh, nice. Oh, and here's the one that's not related, but I thought it was for a sec. Are the pikas in your study site genetically different from other populations? Yeah. Cool. It, that's neat. And it's because they're kind of isolated and they can't get to interbreed and mix genes. Right. Cool. Um, so three different people, Sue Ellen, Mark, and Russ want to know how long pikas live and what's kind of their, their biggest cause of death. Yeah, that's a, a good question. And one that we're, you know, still kind of working out. I think that in the literature, you'll find that they live more, you know, somewhere around like five to seven years um, mm -hmm. in the past. I have uh, some collaborators who are doing some survival analyses who in some habitats, they are not living that long. Um, I can tell you that of the 12 individuals that we marked in 2018, three of them were still alive last summer um, in 2022, which is oh. really cool. Um, yeah. And it's just like, I just, I just, I just love them so much. I mean, I just think that it's so cool to like come back to the same place every year and be like, you again, like, hey, like, yeah. like I snuggled you five years ago and you were an adult then. And so like, you have to be, you know, oh. at least five, <laughs> I guess four yeah. years ago, right? So they, they have to be at least five. So um, yeah, yeah. 
Nice, thanks. Okay, um, are there pikas in South America? Linda thought there were, but now we're not sure. No, no pikas in South America, but there are, uh, uh, there is a rodent that is related to a chinchilla called a viscacha that is oh. ecologically similar to pikas. They are much bigger. They're like this big in many cases, but they also live in rock slides and boulder fields and they cache food. Um, a More like, like a furry rutabaga, would you say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a, yeah, like a big like furry a, turnip. What, veg, a turnip, okay, great. I'm like, I need a vegetable yes. analog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Ken Kingsley says that in the LaSalle's, if you come up, come across old blue and white striped vinyl flagging, that's his from 1992. So I think- Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I'm not that sure that I've seen that, but uh, we'll keep, a, <laughs> keep an eye out for that. And I think that Mallory is actually here. So if she, Mal, if you see that- I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just a few more, and if you need to go, no worries, we'll send you the recording of this uh, with the email you registered tomorrow. But I do want to address, because we just have a few more questions. I think we can do it. Um, so Penny Miller, uh, who is a former zoo person, uh, wants to know, is consideration being given to exhibit pikas in zoos as kind of flagship species? Because a lot of people have never heard of them and they would learn a lot from this. And she said they've done uh, captive breeding and released very successful with other species. And so what do we do? Should we might wait too long? Can they live in yeah. captivity? Yeah, um, the short answer is that for the species, no. Um, they're really, really difficult to keep in captivity. Anybody who's really tried, it's been largely unsuccessful. Um, mm -hmm. One scientist was successful at this who actually studied call regional variation in the calls and he was actually able to keep them in captivity and breed them. But um, I think he had a, a probably, it was really difficult to be able to keep those animals alive. They were probably a small subset of the animals that he tried with. Um, and he had to like basically excavate his backyard and um, have these like semi open in enclosures where the animals could like go down and be down in this like kind of cool subsurface area. Yeah. So um, not a great animal for the zoo. However, some of the species of pikas that are ecologically more like prairie dogs, I think do do well in captivity. So I think that, and don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that the Minnesota Zoo has a, an exhibit that includes a species of pika that comes from Asia. So if you want to go see pikas at a zoo, you can go to the Minnesota Zoo and the Oregon Zoo, um, which helps run a citizen science project that I'm a part with, part of there, um, has a big statue of pika. So you can see that too. Oh, I love that. <laughs> oh, a couple more uh, natural history questions. Does anybody else steal the food cache? I think we talked about this a little maybe, but do yeah, I don't know if we did, but yeah, we have seen, we've seen, we actually have gotten some camera trap videos of marmots stealing from pika food caches. And that's mm -hmm. something that we're really interested in, like how common is that? Um, and I think that people have seen, we've, I've also was part of a different camera trap study where we saw a wood rat stealing from pika hay pile, oh. went into a hay pile and it came out with a big mouthful of food. So yeah. It's it a pack rat, it right? Happen. Mm -hmm. or, oh, yeah, to those of you from Arizona, we call those pack rats. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. that's funny. Um, yeah. Here's a question that's maybe like a bigger question, but why were the mountain goats introduced? Why do we have introduced mountain goats in the mountains? Yeah, I think um, fundamentally for sport hunting, but also oh. for observation because people <sighs> like mountain goats to that be in sense. the mountains. So people okay. like to go see them too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hazel Gordon said she said she saw the pike exhibit at the Museum of Boulder before it closed and she yeah. wants to know how much time was spent to present it including finding the photographers and all of that. Yeah that was really cool um it was for those of you guys who didn't see this exhibit um it was at the the in a museum in Boulder and it was about pikas and um prairies and about like okay. how prairies are so important in carbon sequestration and then about pikas and and climate change and um in terms of how I was involved in that a little bit in terms of helping to write and edit some of the PICA signage, um, but I was not really involved in the whole development of it. So I can't really answer your question about how long it took, but I know that in the Colorado PICA project, there are several very, very talented nature photographers who have been involved with that project for a long time. And so who have been um, a part of that. So I think it was more of an opportunity to like showcase their work um, than it was going out and like looking for people was using people who are already engaged with that project. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Um, finally, we have a couple of app questions. Uh, Brendan wants to know with the app, can you report retroactively or is it only with current observations? Yeah, no, absolutely. You can totally um, 
you can totally report retroactively. The one thing that you need is a GPS coordinate and mm -hmm. the date and time. So mm -hmm. those will be pulled in automatically from your phone, but then you can go in and edit the date and time of your observation. And then you can um, overwrite the GPS coordinate so that you aren't like reporting PICAs in your home or wherever it is <laughs> that you are <laughs> um, when you're doing that. And if you don't have a GPS coordinate, but you know where the, the talus was that you saw the pica. Um, a pro tip, you can actually go to Google Maps and look at the satellite view and uh -huh. find it. And so when you find the place where it was, you can right click on that patch and then it'll actually give you the, the GPS coordinate. So Ooh. get the coordinate that way and then type it into the app in case you didn't have a GPS with you when you saw a pica. Oh, that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, one last, this is more a comment than anything, uh, a suggestion to add uh, links to places of where to get PICA swag on the PICA yes. digital app. So I any is PICA a makers out there, maybe connect with Joe and you can get featured or something. Yeah. That is a great idea. I will say that that in the PICA app, there is a link to the Colorado PICA project. And Ooh. so if you actually like follow the link to the PICA project, then they have links on their website to get PICA swag from the store that I mentioned. So there, it is like, it just is not as, as direct as it could be. Um, so well, thank you for the suggestion. I'll put it in the list of, of things that we want to do to improve the app in the future. Amazing. Well, I think that is the rest of the Q&A. So Joe, I'm going to give you a second. If there's anything you want to say that I forgot to ask you about, is there anything that you need to say? The Jeez. burning facts about that? Um, I hope that each of you has an opportunity to see a pika in your lifetime. And so if you haven't seen one before, you know, go somewhere, find one, um, or at least Google pikas carrying flowers um, as a substitute. If you think that seeing oh, yes. pikas in the, the real world is not um, in your future, in the near future, but um, they're really delightful. I think you'll really enjoy watching them. So I hope that you get to see some. Amazing. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank yeah. you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I'll wrap it up there. You will get an email with a link to watch this video. This is all recorded. Send it to your PICA loving friends um, and you can watch our other videos on YouTube uh, and check us out naturalhistoryinstitute.org. Thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you for your time, Joe. You're the best. Uh, I look yeah. forward to joining you at PICA camp sometime in the future. Did you see I how I invited myself? Yes. <laughs> all welcome. right. Have a good night, everyone.